Are you taking the Solicitor's Qualifying Examination? If so, this video is a practice test to help you prepare for the SQE1 exam. The topic tested in this video is Judicial Bias. I will explain what you need to know for this subject, which I've set out in this easy to learn diagram. We will then go through this practice test question together from the SQE1 exam for this topic. To get the first part of my full SQE preparation course for free, just click on the link below. My goal is to help you prepare for and pass the Solicitor's Qualifying Examination first time. Let's start with what you need to know for the SQE1 exam about judicial bias. The key principle to understand for the SQE for this topic is the principle of judicial independence. This entails unbiased and impartial decision making. A court upon appeal will find a lower court's judgment to be unlawful if the judge was biased. A court will find this to be the case if there was either actual or apparent bias. This is an extension of the principle that justice must not only be done, but also be seen to be done. Another way to put this is that no judge may be a judge in his or her own cause. I did have to raise this issue once on behalf of a client and ask the judge to recuse themselves, that is, stand down, because of a real possibility of bias. So this is a point which may come up in your practice as a solicitor. This principle is also an extension of the human right to a fair trial. This guarantees a fair trial where there is a criminal charge or civil rights or obligations are engaged. Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights guarantees that everyone is entitled to a fair and public hearing within a reasonable time by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law. In cases where an issue of bias is raised, the court will ask whether there was actual or apparent bias. Actual bias is where a judge has either a direct pecuniary, that is financial or proprietary interest in the outcome of the matter, or can otherwise be regarded as being a party to the action through a direct personal interest. An obvious example would be that the judge would be paid for a particular outcome of the case. In such a matter, there is an automatic and irrebuttable presumption of bias. The decision would be held to be unlawful. Regardless, though, of whether there was any actual bias, where the issue of bias is raised, the court should always ask whether there was any apparent bias. Again, we come back to the principle that justice must not only be done, but also be seen to be done. Apparent bias is where either by reason of a different form of interest, so not financial or proprietary, or by their conduct or behaviour, there is a real possibility of bias. If the facts suggest to the court that a fair-minded and informed observer would conclude that there was a real possibility of bias, then the decision will be held unlawful. This legal test was expressed by Lord Hope in Porter and McGill at paragraph 103. The question is whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. These principles apply not only to judges, but also to other decision makers in adjudication roles. So this applies in a situation where, for example, a civil servant adjudicates on a matter rather than a judge. If there was bias in such a case, then such a decision may be amenable to judicial review if there was no right of appeal. So the summary for this topic on the judiciary and unbiased and impartial decision making is you have a decision or judgment, whether by a judge, court or tribunal, or a decision maker in an adjudication role in a government body. Then you have two possibilities where there is bias. Actual bias. These cases are very rare. It is where 
there is a direct financial or proprietary interest in the outcome of the matter. If there is, then there is an automatic and irrebuttable presumption of bias and the judgment or decision is unlawful. Or you have apparent bias. This is where the legal test comes in that you need to learn for the SQE. Whether or not there is actual bias, which will rarely be admitted after the fact, the court will always ask in all cases, would a fair-minded and informed observer conclude that there was a real possibility of bias? If yes, then the judgment or decision is unlawful. This is the correct legal test to apply in all cases where bias is raised. Here is an actual sample question for the SQE for this topic. This is one published by the SRA as being the sort of question that you can get in the SQE for the subject. A client objects to a decision which has been made to grant planning permission for the building of a supermarket on land near his home. The client has discovered that the chairman of the planning committee that made the decision is a non-executive director of the supermarket chain in question. Which of the following best describes the status of this decision? A. Only where the facts suggest to the court that there was in fact a conflict of interest and that the decision was in fact bias, will the decision be held unlawful? B. If the client can prove that a fair-minded and informed observer would naturally conclude that there was a conflict of interest, the decision will be held to be automatically biased and thus unlawful. C. For the decision to breach the rule against bias and thus be held unlawful, the client must prove to the court on a balance of probabilities that the chairman was actually biased. D. Only if the facts suggest to the court that a fair-minded and informed observer would conclude that the decision was bias, will the decision be held to be unlawful? Or E. If the facts suggest to the court that a fair-minded and informed observer would conclude that there was a real possibility of bias, the decision will be held unlawful. Which answer is correct? The answer is E. So let us go through these and explain. The scenario involves a decision maker being a non-executive director and we do not know whether he has any direct financial or proprietary interest in the grant of planning permission. So bearing that in mind and that in all cases the courts will apply the legal test in Porter and McGill for apparent bias, let's have a look at the possibilities. A. Only where the facts suggest to the court that there was in fact a conflict of interest and that the decision was in fact bias, will the decision be held unlawful. This is wrong because, as we know, it is not true that only in cases of actual bias the decision will be held unlawful. Rather, the court will always ask whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. B. If the client can prove that a fair-minded and informed observer would naturally conclude that there was a conflict of interest, the decision will be held to be automatically biased and thus unlawful. This is wrong because the test, as expressed in the case law, is as follows. The question is whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. So the test is not whether there is a conflict of interest, but rather whether there was a real possibility of bias. C. For the decision to breach the rule against bias and thus be held unlawful, the client must prove to the court on a balance of probabilities that the chairman was actually biased. This is wrong because the court will ask not only whether there was any actual bias, but also whether there was apparent bias. 
Again, the test is whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. D. Only if the facts suggest to the court that a fair-minded and informed observer would conclude that the decision was biased, will the decision be held unlawful. This does not express the legal test accurately. Again, the test is whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. See in particular the difference between bias and the real possibility of bias here, the latter being the correct expression of the test. E. If the facts suggest to the court that a fair-minded and informed observer would conclude that there was a real possibility of bias, the decision will be held unlawful. This is correct. You can see that there's a direct correspondence here between this and the expression of the test in Porter and McGill. I hope you found this helpful. To get the first part of my full SQE preparation course for free, just click on the link below. My goal is to help you prepare for and pass the solicitor's qualifying examination first time.